Hello and welcome to this video on question three of this paper, the one taken in June 2017, and it's paper one. Uh, now here's the examiner's report, but I'm not allowed to show it to you. The examiners uh, won't let me. This is top secret stuff. Um, don't ask me why, but uh, I've therefore interpreted it for you. Uh, try not to use any of the language that the examiners have used and just to show you uh, where students went wrong in this question and where they could go right. So the key problem that students had was in not recognizing that question three is a question about structure and analyzing the structure of a text. Uh, instead, lots of students approached it as a language question, uh, finding quotations, naming the technique and writing about that technique um, to show what it revealed about character, for example. Um, and really, you don't interpret quotations in this way in this exam. What you interpret is the structure. So, yes, you might need the quotation to show why there's a change in structure, but the key is in the why, which we'll get to later. Um, at its simplest, and I, I will make new videos on this, uh, you just follow the paragraphs of your text because that's what writers do to show you there's a change in structure. They give you a new paragraph. So actually, this question should be easy. Well, why isn't it? So in the report, the examiner sounds um, really quite puzzled. You know, why did our students find this question so difficult? Why did they get such low marks? Um, and of course, this is what the examiner said. They blame your teacher. It was your teacher's fault. Uh, your teachers don't know how to teach structure because they haven't been doing it before. Um, your teachers keep telling you and other students to use loads of subject terminology. It's their fault. Uh, well, two things. Um, teachers do know how to structure a text uh, and what writers are playing at. What they don't know is what the examiner wants the student to say. Uh, the one thing they do know the examiner wants is this. They want loads of terminology because it's all over the mark scheme. Um, uh, but unfortunately, what's happened is students are using the t terminology but not then answering the question, so the terminology doesn't help them. And then this uh, comment from the examiner that teachers overcomplicate things um, is in green because I think it's true, but the reason that uh, teachers overcomplicate things is because they haven't been shown by AQA what they want about structure, and I'll show you that in this video partly, and I'll also make a new video that shows you exactly how to ace this question uh, when I get back um, some of the papers that my the answers that my students wrote. But of course, there is another really obvious reason why students have done badly in this question and written about language techniques instead of structure. And it's this question three comes after question two. And question two is about language. And so that's what's in your head under pressure of an exam. You're still thinking like you were when you did question two. And after all, writing about language is what you've done ever since you're probably in year four. You know, that's what you do in English. Um, so the examiners missed a trick here. And if they were smarter, they'd put this question before question two. Yeah, so you'd get to it straight away and realize, oh, this is a structure question. I'm not going to write about quotations and analyze the language in it. Um, but no, they, they've not done that. So in my guide, I advise all my students to do this paper backwards. There are loads of reasons for that. But uh, for the purpose of this video, you won't be writing about quotations as language features um, if you haven't done that question uh, first. So if you do question two after question three, you'll be protected against that mistake. Okay, the other reason this is a good question, and you ought to be able to succeed in it quite easily, is that the question is always exactly the same. So it will always say, this text is from the, and then they'll choose the beginning, middle, or end uh, of a story or a novel. Uh, my prediction is that they will nearly always choose a beginning, because that's when there's most structure to the writing. How has the writer structured the text to interest you as a reader? Again, that emphasis on structure. The idea that it has to interest you is, um, well, you just have to pretend, you know, whether it interests you or not. You have to work out what the writer is trying to do. Uh, then there's uh, this really annoying phrase. You could write about what, your, write, what the writer focuses your attention on at the beginning. 
how and why the writer changes this focus and any other structural features that interest you well there is no could you do have to write all of those now what's deeply annoying about this is the examiner desperately wants you to write about the ending uh, but they're not going to tell you that why because students who write about the ending tend to write a very complete answer and usually they use the ending to write again about the beginning you know so we thought this at the beginning but now at the ending we might have to reevaluate what we thought at the beginning well that is a highly developed skill good readers do that they get to the ending and think well how does that change what we thought up to this point um, well the examiners don't want to give you that clue because they think it's uh, making it too easy for you but actually it's dishonest isn't it the examiners want you to write about the ending and they don't tell you to in the bullet points that's why it's so annoying but now you've watched the video you will always look at the ending of the source and think about why it's there okay so the examiners don't blame themselves for this mess up but uh, let's leave that aside they do give us some actually really helpful advice uh, so what should you do here the examiner wants you to look at the text as a whole now remember this text that you're reading is only part of a whole text so this is artificial you know the writer never intended this to be read as a text as a whole and that means the examiner spent a long time finding exactly the right bit of the text where the ending matters uh, and that's another really important clue to write about the ending uh, they want you to look at each paragraph and ask how does this part sorry how does this part influence my thinking about the whole text well obviously the part that most wants you to think that way is the ending isn't it um, that if you're writing about the ending you're always writing about the whole text that just it seems obvious doesn't it um, and then they've simplified that even further when I like that I like when you can simplify something but it always gives you the right answer and so this is it why does that happen there or actually I prefer that as here why does that happen here so why is it in this part of the text um, rather than another part why show us this now and your answer will always get you marks because you're always dealing with the why um, the problem that many students have is they wrote about the what they wrote about the quotation and then said what that showed us about the character um, and that gets you no marks at all this is all about the why right let's have a quick summary of the learning so far what will stop you getting a level four forgetting to refer to the structure of the whole text if you're ignoring the structure you've had it the examiner is quite keen that you move from the beginning to the other structural features remember the beginning was in the first bullet point and that's examiner speak for right about the beginning for God's sake please uh, to the other structural features you notice in the other paragraphs remember every time you have a new paragraph that is a shift of focus and so it's a change in structure and then they want you to go to the ending I'm sure you remember that now because I've banged on about it so much when you get to the ending comment on how this affects your understanding of something that has happened before because when you relate it back to something that has happened before you're saying to the examiner look at me I've understood the whole text uh, so this is another way you can show that you've understood the reason for the ending and now it's worth repeating that the writer hasn't ended the text here uh, because it's only part of a short story or part of a novel but the examiner has and they're pretty much shouting at you go on I dare you I double dare you not to say what the te why that should be what's going on Mr Salles why the text ends like this and so they're desperate for you to actually look at the ending and say why uh, tell me why let me give you the marks so my advice is take the dare always deal with the ending no matter what so what is the problem with subject terminology that I mentioned earlier because you do get marks for it in the exam and your teacher is probably going to sound quite obsessed with it um, but this is why um, the mark scheme says makes sophisticated and accurate use 
of subject terminology. Now that's important because many teachers have thought, well, I've got to teach my students to use sophisticated subject terminology then, don't I? But no, the examiner doesn't mean use sophisticated ton, uh, terminology. She means, although to be fair, when I read the report, he does sound like a man to me. Uh, so anyway, she, she means say something sophisticated in your interpretation of the structure. That's where the sophistication is. But you don't need to give me fancy names. That's, you know, lots of students and teachers are looking at terminology that way and saying, oh, I must teach synesthesia. Or I must teach, um, uh, oh, I don't know, narrative theory or something. Uh, you can see the kind of terminology students overused in my video on question two, because um, it was the same terminology they use in question three. Uh, so to repeat, the terminology isn't that big of a deal. It's showing how it's used and having a sophisticated interpretation of why it's structured the way it is. Right, well, the next thing the examiner complained about is that lots of students uh, were writing about narrative theory because their teachers thought, well, if my students understand narrative theory, um, they're being sophisticated. But the examiner's warning is, well, few of your students could actually understand this properly. And it led to them getting lower marks. So if you are using Todorov's theory, I won't go into it here, but if you're using it, make sure you understand it completely. Otherwise, you'll probably lose marks. Now, if you want to learn about Todorov's theory and write about it, um, you can. Um, and then the key vocabulary would be this. Uh, equilibrium, things are in balance, um, disruption, things are put out of balance. Uh, I simply talk about that being a crisis of some sort. Um, then there's a recognition about the disruption, which here is called the disorder. And then you try to repair that damage of the disruption again. And then you get uh, the restoration or new equilibrium. So you can play around with this vocabulary if you want, but beware. If you use it incorrectly, the examiner thinks you're an idiot. Um, and there's something else you should beware as well. This narrative theory is popular for teachers of um, AS and A-level media studies. Um, well, the chances are the person marking your exam has not taught AS or A-level media studies, and they will be a little unclear about this um, terminology as well. For example, I don't use this theory. I've not taught it. Um, and I actually use different vocabulary to describe these features. Um, so play with it if you want. But if you do, make sure you understand it inside out. Otherwise, you lose marks. So I think, in summary, that you can get full marks on, these question, on this question if you follow this uh, examiner's three pieces of advice. Look at the sequence. Why do we... Sales, what's going on here? Sunday, I'm not writing properly. Why do we find out what happens in this particular order? You know, why structure it in this way? Why do we look at these events from these particular perspectives? So we see things either through the character's eyes or through the author's eyes or sometimes a different character. Well, why? Um, how does that influence us? And finally, why does it begin this way and end this way? If you write about all those things, you will get really high marks and you can easily get full marks. Um, there are some bonus features to this uh, video now, but don't beat yourself up about it. Um, you've learned enough. If you've learned these three things, you're well away. Okay, well, congratulations if you're still here. One of the features of students who learn well is that they overlearn. In other words, they repeat a few things they already know, and that cements it so that in a year's time, it's still there. So I want to come back to this idea of the problem of not saying why. Uh, many, many students did write about the structure. They did write about the beginning and the middle and the end, but they still lost marks. They did not say why this was focused on at the beginning rather than someone else, somewhere else. Why the focus changed in the middle? Um, you know, why change the focus at all? And why the focus ended as it did? And if I keep banging on about why, 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 you will um, always get the marks. 
And then we come back to the problem of naming of parts. This is where the subject terminology comes in. So lots of students spotted shifts in focus, uh, so the different parts of the narrative, and they named them. So they said, yes, this bit is a bit of dialogue, and that bit is a change in narrative perspective, um, and this is a change of time, and this is a flashback, and this uh, doesn't happen in chronological order, and this is in the interior of the character's mind or the setting, and this is in the exterior, we see the outside, or we move from the character's inner world to the world outside. All absolutely awesome, and the examiner loves this kind of language. However, if you don't say why, why, why for each one of those, you do not get the marks. And so my summary of that is, do not just name the parts, but explain the parts. So this question is the explaining of parts. OK, let's imagine you're a student who thinks, yeah, all right, I'm going to go for 100% on this question. Uh, how can you help me, Mr. Sallows? Well, here is that help. Examiners love this word. The word is construct. And it appears in the examiner's reports, not just for this exam, because it's a new one, but past exams going back at least 10 years. Um, and so what they mean by a construct is this has been put together for a purpose. The story is constructed. And, and once you start thinking about uh, stories that way, and you think about characters that way, you're automatically in the top band. So this story is a construct. The character is a construct. Everything is made up. In other words, none of this stuff is real. It only exists, it only exists in the text to make the reader think or feel something. So I teach my students, use the word construct in your answer, because that shows the examiner that you're thinking about structure. And always when you're writing about the why, the answer will be, why? Well, because the writer wants us to think this. Or why? Because the writer wants us to feel this. And that is as simple as that. If you write about why the reader might think this or why the reader might feel this based on the construction of the story, the parts of the story, you can get 100%. So just to remind you, every shift in focus is a construct. Every paragraph is a shift in focus. So every paragraph is part of the construct. Um, Every shift in focus is a way to get the reader to think or feel something. And when you write about that, you get the marks. Explain how we are made to think or feel by this shift in focus, and you get into level four. Simple as. In fact, the examiner will find it impossible not to put you in the level four, the top level, if you do that. Genuinely, they can't. They have to put you in that level. OK, there is one final secret ingredient that the examiners have. Um, they don't tell you this. They don't put it in the question. But it is the final ingredient in the pot. So examiners like you to sum up the whole structure of the text at the beginning. Uh, so a sentence like, you know, the writer begins with the um, interior thoughts of the protagonist uh, before um, focusing on the outside world in order to contrast um, the peace and tranquility of what he sees with the inner turmoil that the character sees, um, thus increasing our sympathy for the character's um, situation. Something like that. Now, they love that because it shows you've read the whole text, and it also shows that you've made sense of the whole text um, as a structured piece. Now, I don't know about you, but I would find that really difficult to do at the beginning of my question. Uh, because in an exam, what happens is I start writing and I kind of find out about the structure as I start writing. Or I find out about how I think and feel about the structure as I start writing. And I don't have time to read the whole thing and then write this kind of summary. Uh, so it, this is a really difficult and time-consuming thing to do the exam. in the exam. You just want to write something about why the beginning begins that way, why a couple of things happen or are described, sorry, um, or placed in the middle, and why the ending ends the way it does. You know, you want to get on with those things 
rather than write this overall summary. And as I've said, it's only when you get to the end that you have an idea of why the whole thing is structured this way. Um, so your first impressions might change during the course of your answer in the exam. So what do we do? Well, as usual, I try not to overcomplicate things. So my best advice is devastatingly simple. Uh, write your answer without thinking about your overview, but leave three or four lines at the beginning of your answer to write your overview in. Then when you get to the end of your answer, you'll have worked out why the whole structure is the way it is. Go back to the beginning, describe the whole structure, saying why it is constructed in this way, and use the word constructed because it reminds the examiner of construct and structure. Uh, and bang, you will look absolutely awesome and you'll get full marks. Genuinely, you will. Um, because hardly anybody writes the overview because it's just so hard to do. But now I've shown you a really simple way to do it. Um, give it a practice, see how you do. Uh, the 100% is yours. What? Another bonus feature? Well, okay, let's uh, let's arm you with something that will be in every single text that you read in this question. This is 100% guaranteed to come up in your question three, and it's the idea of contrast. So as I predicted in my guide, the examiners will love contrast, and the 2017 paper, the first one, was no exception. Uh, and I'm not cheating here by giving you the answer. Because what I'm arguing is that contrast is always a feature of structure and every text that they ever offer you in the exam will have contrast in it. That's just what good writers do. They get you thinking one way and then they contrast it with something else. That's just how they operate. You will get the marks if you do what? What's that three letter word that I keep banging on about? That one. If you explain why the contrast is there how it makes us think or feel, then you will get 100%. And uh, don't think, oh, that only goes to the clever kids. It doesn't. You don't really need to be super clever to work out why the writer has ended a text this way or why it makes you feel this or why it makes you think that. You just have to take the risk. Uh, anyway, well done if you've stuck the video out this far. Um, put it into practice. Go and answer a question. Go and pester your teacher, uh, post a comment below, don't forget to, don't forget to subscribe, and uh, good luck with your revision.